others will follow very soon. And then I'm going to talk a little about quantum information science. And uh, it's more a prep because I see quantum information science having a big impact on cyber. And I know uh, Frank Konetsky, who just gave a talk next door on 5G. Some of you might have been in that talk. I have a, a great admiration for Frank. He's the CTO of the Air Force. And I'm glad to see him in this 5G region and the standard settings that are involved in the testing and experimentation that's going to make major changes in the way we do business. Uh, but Frank is uh, going to have a talk on quantum later. He understands this as best as anybody in the world. So this is probably a prep talk to give you the basics before Frank's talk on quantum as well. So with that, let's, uh, let's get going. And uh, you know, what, what's the right way to look at cyber today? Prep for tomorrow. Uh, you know, there's defense in depth. I firmly believe that a good cyber solution requires hardware working with software, resilient hardware. And by resiliency, I'm referring to the NIST standard of 800-193, which is hardware resiliency. And uh, if you're not designing your systems with hardware resiliency in mind, uh, then you're subjected to going down and staying down. So I, the way I think of it, because of my age, I think of it as the Timex commercial, where the diver from the cliffs of Alcapoco will hold a Timex watch on his arm and dive 200 feet down into the water and come back up and say, hey, it still works. It takes a licking and keeps on ticking. That's resiliency. When you get hit with a cyber attack, because by golly, systems are going to get hit, the adversary is good. They're using AI techniques. And they are spending a lot of money to learn how to get into your systems. So when you get hit, you identify it. You throw them out, and you're back up running within seconds. Not minutes, not hours, not days. But if they do get in, they're out immediately. That's resiliency, and that's what the NIST 800-193 gives you. Gives you that resiliency. But the fence in depth is good, too, so that if one thing is penetrated, you detect it with the next detection device. So that's just. Uh, you know, general motherhood and apple pie here. Uh, we had a research firm come and look, said 350,000 new malware attacks every day. New, now that's generated, you know, 365 days a year. How can they do that? That's just phenomenal. I don't know that I believe that number when I first started it. And then you realize that they're not really creating absolute new malware, they're tweaking old malware. And they're using AI techniques and using script kitties to do minor tweaks on old malware so it doesn't look exactly the same. And by doing that, you know, 99% of them are not going to work. Because we know what the old malware looks like, we know what it did, and we recognize it. And chances are the tweak just wasn't effective. They're looking for the 1%, the 1% that does work. And so uh, the, the AI capability to go tweak some things gives you speed. Cyber of tomorrow is going to be all about speed. The speed of the defense has to equal the speed of the offense. And I know it's football season. So, uh, so it's the same thing in sporting events. If you can't keep up with your opponent, you're going to fall behind in the score. And uh, sure enough, uh, the AI techniques of manipulating Former malware is one of the things that's going to let that adversary get a step ahead of you if they can design attacks faster than you can defend against them. So that was the driver that got us thinking about how can we use AI to look for methodologies to defend against future malware that hasn't been created yet. And that's what I think you'll see as the future. All right. What we call it, this is a marketing term, I'm not a marketer, I'm a technologist. So I uh, am a CTO for HP Federals Group. Uh, that's a, a portion that deals primarily with the government. I do that because I've been working with the government ever since I was uh, 18 years old and raised my right hand, got sworn into the service. Uh, but uh, the deep learning techniques is what we think is an advantage 
and detecting future malware or sensing this looks like, feels like, smells like malware we've seen in the past. And, and in doing so, you can quarantine it, you let the rest of the things go by and uh, see if you can minimize the false positives and false negatives. So a little progression through uh, those that kind of grew up with compute. Uh, my first uh, computing experience was uh, right out of school. I took a course with the GI Bill and how to build a microprocessor, an 8088 machine. I learned how to solder, I learned how to put it up, I learned binary code, and I could add, subtract, multiply, and divide as good as any calculator with this machine. But I, I learned the basics of how a computer works. And so by the time I got to my first uh, assignment, I was put in charge of a PDP-8, which is a digital equipment mini computer uh, that was uh, collecting sensor data and analyzing sensor data. I don't remember the memory, I think it was 2K, and, uh, and it ran on some big disk, and it had these big toggle switches that you had to line up with the right zeros and one, up or down, to get the thing booted up. Uh, I ran into a lady at the uh, New York Strava conference, a data science conference, uh, who I'd known, uh, probably one of the world's best data scientists, her name's Hillary Mason. Uh, she ran Fast Forward Labs and then got bought out by Cloudera, so she's at Cloudera now. And uh, Hillary said, hey, I heard you used to work on PDP-8s. And I said, yes, ma'am, I, I, I used to back when I was a young, young officer in the service. And, she said, do you know where I can get one? I said, you know, I'm sure they don't sell them anymore, uh, but there's probably some around somewhere, you know, some basement or backyard. And she said, yeah, my husband collects antique computers, and he's missing a toggle switch on his PDP-8. And I thought, yeah, this is, you know, really a state of the art here. Uh, some of the things you worked on are now in, in the museums and the antique stores. So, uh, Believe me, you'll be in that same position. The second lieutenant's here, give, give you 30 years, and you'll be looking at some antique museum computers that you used to work on. Uh, so good luck to you. But in the legacy, the antivirus, the Norton, Symantec, the antivirus systems, McAfee, they were looking at signature, signature-based virus detection. So if the zeros and ones lined up in the same order as the same known malware, it was not allowed on your machine, and it was prohibited. They evolved to machine learning, and if you, if you think of how AI works, AI is a broad topic. I, I've been working AI about 40 years, and uh, back in the start days, there were two forms of AI. There were weighted algorithms, and there were expert systems. And think of expert systems as kind of like what Watson was when it won Jeopardy. It was able to go through and and because of known input, it was able to go and retrieve something that was known. A weighted algorithm, think of it like a Bose headset. You're getting sound wave in, it's analyzing the wave and putting out a reverse uh, sign or a reverse signature to cancel out the sound. And, uh, and so that's weighted algorithm. That, that's what AI meant to, and they, and they were using some vision to put car windshields on the cars in the production line. There was some work in computer vision that was quasi-AI. But today, I, I can probably count 32 different facets of AI, all the way from natural language processing to deep learning that I'll go to. But the, the way, you know, there's structured data, there's unstructured data. Uh, but in the AI world, you go to machine learning. And uh, machine learning, probably the way the best think of machine learning is uh, try to discern a picture of a dog or a cat. And you put 700 pictures of dogs into the algorithm, process against 700 pictures of cats, and it's looking at the difference between the eyes, the kind of nose it has, they have a tail, what's the tail look like, and measurements of the tail. And the algorithm, when you get the next picture and you don't want to tell it, the machine, is it a dog or a cat, it should be able to come out with this is more like a dog than a cat will call it a dog. And that's what machine learning techniques do. Uh, there were four grad students in MIT 
they were given a project at Boston Woman's Hospital uh, to go and investigate mammograms or radiography pictures and see what they could find using machine learning techniques. And uh, this is written up in The Second Machine Age, which is a book by Eric Brinjolison, who uh, he and Andrew McAfee were two MIT data scientists that uh, looked into how can you use data to enhance the way we're living, kind of a history of data science. Uh, they actually hit on the uh, top 10 of the New York Times bestsellers list. Probably 50 years since an MIT professor has had a book on the bestsellers list. But they, uh, uh, they wrote about these two, these four kids went out there with no knowledge of uh, radiography or reading, ra were able to take the data and through machine learning techniques being able to discriminate cancer versus non-cancer. You know, here's 700 pictures of cancer, here's 700 pictures that don't have cancer. Now what's this one look like? And get it accurate to 92%. Where the pathologists who do this for a living were hitting about 72%. So almost a 20% increase because they, they weren't trying to use their judgment. They were just trying to say, what do the numbers say? Now when you put the machine learning techniques together with the learned and trained pathologists, the number went even higher to 95, 96%. So, you know, it's an example of how a human machine working together can get a pretty accurate read. And, and from the aspect of cyber protection, machine learning techniques really improved our ability to detect malware. But the difference was that you really had to have malware you'd seen before because that's what you're training your data set on, known cancer, known un, not cancer, known dog, known cat and you're developing an algorithm on the knowns, so if you have an unknown creature, it's kind of hard to say, what is it? And so that's where you go into a deep learning technique. It's a subset of machine learning, and it's a convolutional neural network, if you know what they are, so there's a feedback loop. It's nonlinear, so the algorithm is not a linear algorithm. Uh, but what you're doing there, well, we'll get to it. Next slide. So. What we did, we took over 100 million examples of malware. And, and someone said it's close to a billion. We don't want it. You know, nobody was counting. We got everything to get our hand on that we knew was intended to damage your system. And we put that into a, a very large processing computer and worked the algorithm uh, for a long time and came up with about a terabyte sized algorithm. Uh, that could accurately detect new malware. Uh, we downsized that to fit on an endpoint, on a laptop, on a desktop, on a printer, uh, even a 3D printer, which we are making now, and got that down to about 100 megabytes, and that's the agent that you can put onto the machines. So uh, the end result was we're hitting about 99% detection of new malware that hadn't been detected before. So the sensor's not perfect. You know, it's not going to stop everything. Uh, but it's going to stop a lot of the new attacks that are coming in on a daily basis. Uh, the latency is an issue. If you're going to do something like that, you've got to worry how this is slowing up your system. If you're working in real-time systems, 20 milliseconds may not be good enough. Real times are usually three to four milliseconds. So it is a slow up, but you can tailor that down receive more false positives, and kind of reduce your latency. Uh, and the CPU load, which is a driver indicator, that's about a 1% add to your CPU. So it depends on what kind of CPU you're processing with. These are out on our Elite books now, uh, really working well, and uh, you'll see more of that as, as it comes in the future. All right, so layers of defense. So these, these are kind of things that we think of in the layers of defense. The threat protection was the sure sense that I uh, just described. Uh, sure click is another layer. Uh, you've heard some tests. In fact, the uh, uh, General Skinner just was talking about how they went to UCOM and did all these uh, phishing examples. And 10% of the people at UCOM clicked on the fish. You know, they, they went fishing, reeled them in. 
Uh, and, and that's probably about average. I don't, I don't think that's unusual, nothing against the people in Yukon. You can make these things look really real. I, I know I've got one from Bank of America. I would have sworn it was an email from Bank of America. It wasn't. And the only thing that caught my eye was the address of the at BOA because it had some extra letters in there where they had screwed up the email address for the return address. I didn't click, sent it in, sure enough, malware. But it looked and feel, they'd gotten the graphics and made it look like a Bank of America email. And since I bank with Bank of America, my instincts were just to click. Uh, what the sure click does is when you click on our elite book machines, it brings it up in a virtual machine so that it will operate in its own environment. And if it's gonna go off site and download malware, that malware is then downloaded to the virtual machine. And when you exit out of your browser, it disappears. So it goes away. Uh, Windows Defender, any of you use Windows Defender? Some of you do, some people use McAfee or other things, they're all good. Uh, but Windows Defender has gotten better. And uh, I'm impressed with the way they're operating right now. And a lot of people over the years have made fun of Bill Gates and Windows. And, you know, the hackers all want to attack the Windows because there are a whole lot more of them than there were of OS systems uh, up until the phones came out. That, that was true. But the Windows Defender, because of the investment Microsoft has been making, has really improved uh, the protection that I give you, and that's, that's what I use. I, I don't add on the McAfee per se, you can. I'm not sure it provides any extra benefit uh, because uh, we, we invest about a billion and a half a year to improve the cyber that are involved in our products. That's a significant investment. And, and we focus just in our products. We're on a sixth generation out in the field today. The seventh generation's in test and we're planning on the eighth generation. So every year we're trying to roll out improvements. So the sure sense that I've talked to you about on your, your deep learning, your neural networks, it will be better next year and even better the year after. Plus we're gonna invest to make this better and find out what we don't know and learn what got through that we should have stopped and get better. And then our endpoint controller, this is probably the thing that I'm most excited about is the bias <coughs> protection uh, from using a hardware-software combination where we have an encrypted hardware BIOS that is cryptographically signed and put in to each individual machine. And it checks what has been loaded on boot into memory. And if there is difference during operation, it flushes memory and it reloads it. And that's the definition of resiliency, that it can take a hit, you can get a low jack attack or something that's coming in under the operating system it will be detected if it's attacking the BIOS, and it will be removed and replaced. And that's the kind of speed of defense that's gonna keep up with the speed of the offense. So you might get 15 to 30 seconds in the machine to do something, but uh, it's, gonna, it's not gonna reside for 189 days as a persistent threat underneath the operating system. That's what we were trying to stop there. That's a little bit uh, of sense that just says, hey, this stuff can work, you know, this is the state of the art, but it uh, works offline. So quantum information science, this is where it gets exciting. Uh, there's probably $20 billion a year invested in quantum research around the world. Right? And this is the message I really want to get out, is that 20 billion a year, only about 477 million is from the U.S. government. Uh, that's a very small sum. Uh, now there are other classified programs that Dana Deasy has discussed with me that they are investing in in the services. He's the CIO for DIOD. He understands this problem and in investment. He would like to have more money, but you can. You still got to buy planes and tanks and ships, and so you know there's a constraint to any need that the services have. Uh, there's a rest of government needs to invest in this. National Science Foundation is doing a pretty good job with their quantum leap program. DARPA has some quantum programs. They looked at quantum annealing, and now they're looking at some other things. 
but the quantity of funds, Australia spends about twice what we do, uh, the UK is about equal to what we do, the European Union is about three times total in quantum information science, and I'm not talking about a quantum computer. Quantum computing is a whole other field, it's a subset of quantum information science, uh, but there are things of knowledge in quantum, we'll cover them, uh, that can be scary. The Chinese invest 10 billion a year in quantum information science. Most of this in quantum communication, some of it in quantum key distribution. We'll talk a little bit about this as well. But when you realize that a Chinese researcher cost 80% less than a US researcher doing the same thing, they just don't pay them that much. And yet, you know, they're happy to work there. They don't have the competition we have in the U.S. by industry trying to grab them out of the lab, out of the academia, and put them to work in product development. Uh, and because of that, that 80% less means that the 10 billion U.S. that they're spending is equivalent to us spending 50 billion. And yet we're spending 477 million, three orders of magnitude. Really, almost three orders of magnitude less. So what should we be doing? I mean, if all we do is read Chinese literature, I don't read Mandarin, but I kind of wish I did, uh, that would be something. And look at when the science heads from science to time to productize some of this thing. And if we can be the first to patent and product, then I think we'll be okay. So that's kind of, what is it? What is quantum information science? It's the ability to use at macroscopic or microscopic scale atomic information to carry information. All right, so uh, th this is something that I have worked on the last four or five years uh, with a company called Cubitech out of Carlsbad, California. There are several companies that do things like this, and it is a uh, quantum key distribution capability, but they make a kit and they sell it to high school physics lab of how you do entanglement of photons. And so by entangling photons and sending it to two different ends of a fiber optic wire, you can show that you're gonna get the same results every time, that the two photons are gonna have be parallel created in the same manner. And uh, what they're looking for primarily, uh, the kit says you know, $50,000 for your high school science fair. That, that was years ago. I think they're down to about $10,000. They're so making enough of these and putting them out, and the high schools want to make sure that their students are up to speed in some of the latest science that uh, these things are coming out. And uh, they're looking at polarity. So uh, a light ray has a polarized face, and that polarized face is looking at uh, uh, either a vertical or horizontal polarization. It's like your sunglasses. You wear sunglasses, you know, you're either vertically or horizontally polarized, so only half the light gets through. Well, that's kind of the, what they're looking through here. All right, so classic states uh, that quantum can use is the spin of electron, charge, plus or minus, polarization, uh, and there are several other factors. Electron spin uh, of, uh, uh, is either up or down in an atom, and so by just measuring a spin, if it's an up, you count it as a one, if it's a down, you count it as a zero. These are some of the basis of using quantum information to carry uh, digital information. Uh, this is a uh, block sphere, so we're going to start uh, to get to what a qubit is. Uh, uh, a block sphere, instead of having a uh, classic bit of being a zero or a one, and that can put in enough zeros or one in a string, we'll carry an information, get you a binary code. A block sphere is, it can be anything from zero to one or anything in between. So you start looking at vectors. You know, you start talking about quantum computing, you're looking at things like a block sphere so you can simultaneously calculate every position and calculate that in, uh, it's called a superimposed time or in faster than real time. And that gives you the speed to do things like break encryption. So SHA-256 encryption I think it was designed to be 100 years brute force unhackable. Uh, I did some back of the envelope computations and said if you really had 
use Shor's algorithm, which is a quantum algorithm with a quantum computer, that could probably go down to four hours. So if you're encrypting things and four hours later somebody can read, is it really encrypted? Uh, I've been told by some real experts that four hours is really not the right calculation. You, you miss something in your numbers. It's more like four seconds. Uh, but it depends on your assumptions. And, and so, you know, you're wasting your time to encrypt it if it can be decrypted by a machine four seconds later. Fortunately, we don't have a quantum computer today. Uh, within five to ten years, we will. And uh, certain countries uh, are collecting classified encrypted data that we produce because they know in four or five years they'll be able to read it all. So that's the risk. Now the good news is NIST is working to replace this. NIST is working to make a quantum resistant encryption capability to replace SHA-256 or SHA-512. And they started with 70 algorithms. They've knocked that down to 26. Uh, by the end of this year, they hope to have five remaining candidates and by next year select one or two that would be the finalists. So they're testing to say, hey, if we had a quantum computer, if we had something that could do this kind of processing, how good would this new algorithm be? And there's some techniques out there that are pretty impressive. Okay, uh, there's a problem in measurement in quantum systems that once you measure it, it changes the state. So, uh, so superposition is a concept that you can be in two places at once, that's part of your entanglement, two things that are entangled with each other, the same thing but in two different places. Uh, but as soon as you look and measure, then it's fixed. And uh, did any of you take physics and study Schrodinger's cat? All right, Schrodinger's cat, uh, Heisenberg uh, came up with this concept. Uh, anybody watch Breaking Bad, Heisenberg? So that should be a familiar name if you knew Breaking Bad. So Schrodinger's cat, Heisenberg came up with the principle that the cat is in a box and it's either alive or it's dead and you don't know which, but it's gonna be in state one or state two. The electron spin is gonna be up or it's gonna be down, and you don't know which until you look and measure. So you open the box and then you see, but once you see that's the state it's in, you can't change the state. Well, I guess for the cat, if it was alive, you could always kill it, but that Schroeder Heisenberg didn't go through that. Anyway, this just tells you how you measure and think of it like a photon uh, a particle of light uh, that is being measured for polarity, you know, it's going to be a zero or a one, something in between. It's the in-between cases you have to learn how to deal with. And, and one of the interesting things in physics is at the quantum level, is the light a particle or is it a wave? If you can create a single photon, is it a particle or does it still have the properties of a wave of light with multiple particles? And the, uh, the answers the physicists will give you is both. Now that seems like a cop-out to me, but I tend to think of it more as a particle effect uh, than a wave effect, but it's still vibrating like a wave. And it, so it still has vibrational energy with polarity involved. All right, so this, this is a study on entanglement that uh, if I impact a electron here, 12,000 miles away, if it's entangled with an electron there, that they instantaneously will change state at the same time. Uh, that's a mind bender. I uh, would tell you I understand it, but I don't. Uh, and, and even uh, some of our best physicists of today say, it's a concept, it's a theoretical principle, it has been proven in experiments, but it's really not understood. Uh, but the, the part of the thing that really trips people up in this entanglement issue, if you could really do that, the instantaneous change means you can travel faster than the speed of light. The change is occurring faster than the speed of light. And that's what gives rise to some of these science fiction novels of how you travel faster than the speed of light. So uh, not really relevant to what we're uh, gonna deal with in cyber today, but it's an interesting fact that might be important. 
Well, we've already talked a little bit about qubits, and uh, I won't go into any more of that, but it's really, there's a real component, an imaginary component. I know any electrical uh, electricians out there, you know your three-finger rule, uh, current motion flux, and so that's the way I kind of think of the, uh, the qubit. All right, so here are six fields in quantum computing. I'm going to add a couple of more that are already here that are not on this list. Uh, quantum key distribution, uh, that's where you can entangle two photons, you send it down 20K of fiber optics, it's red on polarity, uh, uh, horizontals are zero, verticals are one, and you create a key, not a 256-bit key, you create a key as long as the number of photons you send out. So it can be a, a, a million-bit key. There, there's no limit, you just collect the zeros and ones until you want to say after a million, that's my key. And you don't need a public key, so there's no public key infrastructure that you can break in man in the middle attack, kind of goes away. The only way to hack into this system is to get physical access to the fiber. And when you do that, when you get physical access to the fiber and you inspect to see whether that photon is a zero or a one or a horizontal or a vertical, then it interrupts and changes the polarity and you don't get the same thing at the other end if you get the light at all. It's a single particle. The particle goes to the hacker. And so the key won't work between the two sites. And so it's a, it's a pretty foolproof key. Now, if you're at one of the endpoints and see the reading at the endpoint, you can physically be there. Then you can determine what the key is. But what the heck? If you're at the endpoint, you're not going to be reading the key. You're just going to be physically breaking up the gear. I mean, it's, and so it's uh, been bought by the San Diego utilities to protect their SCADA devices. And uh, it has recently been sold to Pacific Gas and Electric to cover all California utilities. Uh, of course, Pacific Gas and Electric went bankrupt, so I'm not sure they're going to pay for it, but they, they did see the value in SCADA protection on a facility. And, uh, and they're going to distribute it, I think, uh, within the next two to three years if they can scale. Uh, Cubitech's going to be having these systems all over the world. We'll see. Uh, quantum materials. There's some uh, use of quantum science in material development to get properties you want. Uh, this is particularly uh, being used in the pharmaceutical industry, so not necessarily tied to cyber. Quantum sensing is being used in systems today. Uh, anybody heard of a SQUID, a super cool quantum interface device? A very, very sensitive detector of magnetic fields. So uh, you, know, you detect to the Tesla level of a magnetic field. And, and that is uh, being used, uh, potentially uh, could be used as a navigational replacement for GPS. Uh, I, I don't know uh, that they're headed that direction or they're using it, but you know, if you could know specific magnetic field strength in any location in the world, then you can quickly triangulate that as you move. Uh, so the simulation that quantum can do, uh, quantum simulation is, is be very useful in uh, process development or chemical reactions or things like nuclear blast simulation. And uh, the quantum compute we talked about, the two that I didn't mention were quantum memory. If you can store things at a quantum level, you know, you could put the Library of Congress on the head of a pin. Once again, my analogy breaks down when the experts tell me, no, Gardner, you're all screwed up. You can you store hundreds of Library of Congresses on the head of the pen at the quantum. Yeah, and that's because of Avogadro's number of atoms. If you really could create where atoms created this digits for memory, you could, you could do that. And the uh, quantum random number generator. From an encryption point of view, this is probably the most important. If you get a, a true random number generator, which we don't have today, then you've got the ability to get fully homomorphic encryption. And if you could create this device that's in test right now uh, from a company out of Virginia that creates a true random number generator, it's going to change our encryption processes. And NIST is aware of this, they're looking at this, and I think it's got great potential. All right, so this is, uh, I think I've described this, how quantum key distribution works, fiber optics, you've got a sensor on each end, 
You've got a transmitter that's entangling two photons and sending them in two different directions. Slave and a master. Uh, the Chinese have claimed to do uh, quantum key distribution over a length of 1,200 miles. They claim to have faster than light communication. Uh, the truth is that the entangled pair they're trying to distribute uh, over that distance, it works about one out of a million times, and it only works at night. So the Chinese have been successful in the test. It doesn't work every time. So the functionality is not there. But if you're going to spend equivalent 50, mil billion, 50 billion a year, chances are they're going to start to work through some of these problems. So it's a risk if you can get to quantum faster than light communication. Uh, and there's a question of whether it's truly faster than light or not. Uh, this is uh, the quantum key distribution, so very much like what Cubitech does. But what they're doing right now, the Cubitech is not, is amplifying the signal. So to amplify a particle of light so it can go further than about 20K and make it go 1,200 miles, that's a trick. And there's techniques that may be able to do that. We don't understand them yet. We're, we're learning about it. But to do that without losing the polarity they originally had, that's the trick. And uh, there are people working on that right now. Uh, quantum sensing is, uh, you know, can you, can you go down to that atomic level and sense? I think this is something that's most likely to be involved in compute long before a quantum computer is. You'll see a hybrid computer. If you, if you think of the days, back to my example of the 8088 chip, and if those of you remember having a computer like that, you had the option to buy an 8087 math coprocessor. And the math coprocessor accelerated the calculations enough. Uh, and so in the quantum hybrid, you'll have a conventional workstation that'll have four to eight qubits that are associated with the workstation, and you'll offload the heavy math to the qubits. And so it would be like the 8087 math coprocess. And quantum sensing, here's a Lockheed uh, satellite-less navigation. Uh, it's based on a diamond flake nitrogen vacuum sensor. So it's uh, very similar to a squid. All right, so here's the revolution you're gonna see in quantum information security. That's the big deal. That's what impacts cyber and the future of cyber. Sensing and measurement, materials are gonna change. New materials are gonna be there. Room, temper super, room temperature superconductivity is one of the areas they're looking at. If you can get to that and you can start to build the quantum computing at an economical cost, because you're not pouring millions of dollars in just to keep the thing super cooled every year. And, uh, and, and I think the quantum random number generator is going to be the biggest impact of all, and that's probably within a year you're going to see a commercial product in that field. So if you're interested in learning more, I recommend to you uh, Dr. Philip Ball. He's a uh, rights for nature, but uh, he's got a YouTube video, uh, Beyond Weird, pretty easy to remember. It's written down here. Everything you thought you knew about quantum physics is different. Uh, he's entertaining, he's understandable, and uh, he gets great examples. And I've tried not to steal any of his examples, but I encourage you to listen to his video. He has a book, the book's a little longer to get through in more detail. Uh, in the video, he doesn't use a single equation, but he helps you understand the concepts. So I'd refer to you to that. There's some other things here if you really want to get into this. And uh, other than that, I'll stop. And uh, we've got about five minutes for questions. If anybody wants to, uh, questions or uh, uh, first question. No. I've got a coin if you want a challenge coin. That's uh, <laughs> That's fine. Here's a question. Yes, sir. There's a couple of companies now that have quantum computers. Uh, I've read some that said you have to have at least uh, five qubits or something like that. Yeah. Uh, uh, IBM's working on it. Google's working quantum. They're using ion trap methodologies. Uh, there's seven different qubit potential forms or factors that NSF is tracking. Uh, D-Wave is using quantum annealing. And IBM's claiming they got about 2,500 
2,600 cubits. The, the truth is, with the ion trap methodology, uh, they only last for like a quarter or three quarters of a second, and then it disappears. So you've got to do all your calculations in a very small amount of time. And the 10 cubits are required to error correct one that you're using to calculate. And so because there's so much noise in the quantum fields, most of the qubits are used for noise reduction, error correction, or getting the signal to noise ratio right. So there is some investment, and that investment is not included in the 477 million that NSF says the US is investing. So we do have private investment that's adding to the, you know, the 20 billion over the course of the year. So that's good. Let's wrap it up there. I'm down here for a while. Come get your coin. And uh, thanks for your time.